Jesus, we thank you so much that we are privileged and blessed to gather as your people together. And Jesus, as Mike comes and shares about the beauty and the gift of rest, Lord, would we be reminded that it is not in our striving, not in anything that we can do, but in your work that has already been done on the cross, that we are saved and that we can rest in. Jesus, would you be mighty in this place? Would you be glorified in this place today? In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We're going to take a brief fellowship break, so greet someone you know, someone you haven't met before, and when the timer comes out and Mike comes up to the front, please return to your seats. All right, you guys can make your way back to your seat. You guys can make your way back. Good morning, church family. It's good to see you guys. Uh, like uh, Josh said earlier, uh, we're doing a two-week series here. Actually, Chester Park is doing a, a different series. We wanted just for two weeks to be able to do some kind of campus-specific uh, topics. And so over at Chester Park, they were doing some topics that Dean thought would be helpful for them on, on evangelism and prayer. And then over here at Lincoln Park, as Kyle and I were talking before his sabbatical, we thought, you know what, we're going into summer. I feel like work and rest might be a really a uh, helpful topic for a lot of people. And then starting next week, we're going to be going through the book of First Thessalonians over the summer, which is actually a book I, I was looking back over Rock Hill's history. I don't think we've ever preached even on First Thessalonians, let alone like through the whole book. And I, I think it has a lot of themes that will be really helpful for, for us together to think about over the summer. Um, before I get started, you might have noticed if the, the keen observers of you, something new in the seats in front of you, they're kind of scattered around. It's these uh, pads of paper that have uh, space for you to take notes on the message. Um, we got this idea from another church, uh, and we thought it might be helpful. It might open up some space on the bulletin so you don't have to write in those tiny little lines if you're a note taker. Uh, and we wanted to you know, kind of come out with these after Kyle was gone on sabbatical because we knew you would actually start paying attention to the sermon uh, if Kyle was gone. So. So those are there if you want them. Uh, let me pray for us, and we'll get started this morning. Father God, I am grateful that we are here. I'm grateful that we get to open your word and hear truth. And uh, Father, I pray that as we open the Bible, that you would also open our eyes, and that your spirit would soften our hearts, so that we, we can hear the truth that you have for us this morning. We pray this in the good name of Jesus. Amen. So let me begin with a, a scenario. Um, say you and I are going out for coffee or, or lunch. Um, and, and by the way, I love getting meals with people. I think it's one of the best ways that human beings can get to know one each, uh, each other is, is over food. So if you want to get a meal with me, uh, on me, just let me know after the service. That'd be great. So you and I are sitting down at a table, and I ask you, how are you doing? What's your kind of automatic response to how are you doing? The, the, the top three ones that I hear are uh, good, yeah, I'm doing good. Uh, if, you're, if you're not doing so good, but you're Minnesotan and you don't want to say so, you say I'm doing fine, you know, I'm doing fine. And then here's the one that I hear from almost every single person, I'm busy. Yeah, life is good, but I'm just really busy right now. I, I have never sat down with somebody and they've said, you know what, 
not a lot going on right now. I've got a ton of free time on my hands. Uh, John Mark Comer is a pastor in Portland, and he wrote a book called The Ruthless Elimination of Hurry, and it's been immensely popular. It's, it's really kind of touched a note in people's hearts. And his main point is that hurry, busyness, hustle, frenzied activity is one of the main spiritual dangers that Christians face today. So, uh, you know, we're not just talking about a sort of fast pace of life or having a lot to do. Like Jesus, if you read the Gospels, Jesus was busy, but he was never hurried. Now, what we're talking about is when you have too much to do, and the only way to keep up with all that you have to do is to rush and be hasty all the time. And I'm just going to assume that all of us deal with this problem, or at least have at some point in our lives. Maybe this morning, maybe even right now, you're thinking about all the things that you need to do later when you're done with church, and you're worrying about how they're all going to get done, or, or the things you need to do this week. And what I want you to hear is that there is spiritual danger to living that way for very long. Now, there's physical danger to that sort of hurried pace of life. Stress is not good on the body, right? Uh, there's relational danger that can happen. Have you ever heard that old song, The Cat's in the Cradle? You know, when you're coming home, Dad, I don't know when. Families get torn apart by constant work and activities, right? So there's, there's physical danger, there's relational danger, but there's also spiritual danger. See, a busyness in our schedules often reveals a busyness in our souls. When we are overloaded with things to do, we forget that the Christian life is not about what we do, but about God's grace for us. And so here's how I think this cycle works. I've, I've got it up on the screen here. So when we are hurried, we have a hurried life, God gets pushed to the margins. Or he just becomes another item on the checklist. All right, I did my God stuff for today. Or worst of all, he becomes the kind of taskmaster who says, not enough, not enough, keep working harder. And when that happens, we begin to treat God as though we need to work hard in order to please him. There becomes this shuttle, subtle shift from grace-based to work-based. And when that happens, we try and work harder, and we end up sort of surfing through life, but not actually living life. Author John Ortberg put it this way, for many of us, the great danger is not that we will renounce our faith. It is that we'll, we will become so distracted and rushed and preoccupied that we will settle for a mediocre version of it. We will just skim our lives instead of actually living them. Or Corey Ten Boom put it even more bluntly. She said, if the devil cannot make us bad, he will make us busy. Church family, the overly busy life is not how you are meant to live. And so how can we break this cycle of hurry? I think this is where the very first pages of the Bible can help us. See, remember that the book of Genesis was written to former slaves. It was written to the people of Israel after God rescued them from Egypt. So imagine for a moment if you were an Israelite slave, right? You have never worked for yourself. You've never had freedom. You've never had rest. And then this God of your ancestors saves you. And he says, I want to show you a different way to live. How does he do that? Well, in the first pages of Genesis, he tells you a story of how he made the world. How God himself works and rests in perfect balance. And so although we are not slaves, we do need God's wisdom and help if we want to break this cycle of busyness in our lives. So the big question that we're going to be asking from Genesis and from some other scriptures this morning is this, how can we find rest in a world of hurry? How can we find rest? So in order to answer that question, we're going to break it down into two parts. First, we'll talk about the design of rest, and then second, the rescue of of rest. And then we're going to end with some practical principles so that even today, even this week, you could begin to break that cycle of hurry in your life. All right? So that's where we're going. 
Uh, we're going to start with the design of rest. Would you go ahead and open your Bibles, if you have one, to page one of the Bible? There should be maybe a Bible under the seat in front of you, or you've got it on your phone. Page one of the Bible, Genesis 1-1. So, on page one of the Bible, God creates a perfect, beautiful ordered world out of chaos. And he does so, we're told, in six days. And then on the seventh day, God rests. So whether you're a Christian or not, most of you are probably familiar with this part of the Bible. And and some of you may actually be a little bit worried that I'm going to start talking about like the creation debates and the age of the earth and all that stuff. And while that's interesting, I think that sometimes those conversations miss the bigger picture of what Genesis 1 and 2 is, is trying to do. Namely, These chapters go out of their way to teach us about the concept of rest. In other words, I I think that the seven days of creation are all about that seventh day of rest. So, a a quick word about numbers in the Bible before we go any further. So, you'll sometimes find weird Christians on YouTube who are like super into numerology in the Bible, and usually it's the book of Daniel or Revelation, and they're like, if you read 666 upside down and backwards and in Latin, it spells nuclear war or something like that, and you're like, I don't really see that. But numbers in the Bible don't really work that way. Usually, numbers have cultural meanings that everybody who is in that culture just knows, which is the way that we use numbers often as well. So if I were to tell you, I'm feeling a 10 out of 10 this morning, you guys would understand that I'm feeling like top notch, I'm feeling phenomenal. And it's the same way in the numbers in the Bible. Actually, the number seven in Israel and in other ancient cultures represented completeness, fullness, so I guess if you were an ancient Israelite, you would say, I'm feeling a seven out of seven, you know? And you'd mean, I'm feeling great. Um, in, in Hebrew, the word seven is spelled with the same consonants as the word for full or complete. So they're related words. And throughout the Bible, they often do plays on words, you know, using seven and complete. Now, here's why this is important. If you were reading Genesis 1 and 2 for the very first time as an ancient Israelite, there's one thing that you would notice Kind of above all, there are sevens all over the place, popping up all over these chapters. Uh, For example, the very first line of the Bible, uh, Genesis 1-1, in our English translation, I think it has maybe ten words. In Hebrew, it has seven words. Barashit bara Elohim et hashamayim va'et ha'aretz. You're like, okay, seven right off the bat. The very next line, Genesis 1-2, has seven times two words, 14 words. You go, huh, I'm starting to see a pattern here. How many days of creation are there? There's seven. So there's seven paragraphs here, and each of them, except for that last one, which we'll talk about in a moment, each of them ends with, and there was evening and there was morning. There's more. So the three key nouns uh, in Genesis 1-1. So in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. God, heavens, and earth all appear in this story in multiples of seven. God appears five times seven times. Heavens and earth both appear three times seven times. Uh, God mentions that creation is good. He says creation is good how many times? Seven times, that's right. And then to close it all off, the very last part of the the last paragraph, which, like I said, we'll look at in a moment, has three times seven words in it to sort of end it up. So there's more than this. Scholars have noticed these throughout the centuries. There's one scholar named Umberto Casuto, who's an Italian scholar, kind of like made a whole list of all the sevens that he saw in here. Now, This could all be accidental, and you guys could be thinking, Mike, I think you're kind of one of those crazy YouTube guys (laughs) right now. It could be accidental that all these sevens pop up. Or what I think is more likely is that the author of Genesis is using the literary design of this creation story to say, hey, the number seven is really important. I really want you to get that. Why? So you can pay close attention to that seventh day, because it is different than all the other days. So let's do that now. Let's go ahead and look at the second page of the Bible, Genesis 2, verses 1 through 3. I'll have it up on the screen there for you. So Genesis 2, 1 through 3. Thus the heavens and the earth were finished, and all the host of them. And on the seventh day, God finished his work that he had done, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work that he had done. 
So God blessed the seventh day and made it holy, because on it God rested from all his work that he had done in creation. So starting in verse, verse 1, we get that bookend with Genesis 1.1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and now God finishes the heavens and the earth. Like Kelsey talked about last week, that work of forming and filling creation is, is complete. There's nothing else to be done. And then in verse 2, we get it repeated, God finished his work, and then we get this interesting phrase that God rested. What on earth does that mean? Now, the word for rest is actually a word that most of you, whether you're a Christian or not, probably know. It's the word Shabbat, as in Sabbath. The, the word literally means to cease, to stop, to end. God Sabbathed. He ceased from the work of creation. Now, I know a lot of you are doing house projects right now. We've got a lot of DIY people uh, in this church and here in Duluth. And so every Sunday, it feels like I talk to you and you're like, what'd you do for your Saturday? Well, I built a deck, you know, or something like that. A lot of you guys have house projects going on in the summer. What does the Sabbath mean in in this context? What does it mean that God rests? It's that moment that you are longing for when you're doing a house project. It's the moment when all the finishing touches are done. All of your, even the most perfectionist of you, all of your perfectionist instincts are satisfied. You can find nothing else to do. You put the tools away and you look back and you go, huh, I think I'm done. That's what it means for God to Sabbath, to cease. God, who is the ultimate perfectionist, if we want to use that word, he made a perfect creation. And his rest is God saying, it is finished. My work is done. Then look at verse 3. God blessed the seventh day and made it holy, because on it God rested from all his work that he had done in creation. When God blessed human beings, he told them to be fruitful and multiply, and now he's blessing the seventh day to be, be the same. What does it mean for a day to be to fruitful and multiply? It means that it will be a time of flourishing, a time of goodness, a time of thriving. God blesses and makes holy the seventh day. So I think in this context, it means two things. One, it means the seventh day is separate. It's different from all the others. And two, it's significant. It is a sign that is pointing to a bigger reality. And I think what it's pointing to, we get a clue that unlike all the other days of creation, this day does not end with the phrase, and there was evening and there was morning. Jewish and and Christian scholars have noticed this for centuries. So you have the first day, God does something, there was evening, there was morning, day ends. Day two, God does something, there was evening, there was morning, day ends. And it's like that all through six days. You get to the seventh day, God does nothing. And then there's no evening and there's morning. It's, It's almost like the day doesn't end. The day is still continuing. We're still in the seventh day. Scholar Matilda Frey described it this way, the seventh day is blessed and established as the part of time that assures fruitfulness, future orientation, continuity, permanence for every aspect of life. In other words, the seventh day is what we would consider paradise, a time of eternal rest, a time of peace, a time of harmony, a time of life to the fullest. God created this world. He finished his work. And then he said, now we can all rest. God, creation, humanity, in perfect harmony, we can rest forever. This is the design of rest. This is how you were made to live, at eternal rest in peace with God. But that's not what happens. It doesn't last. Instead of enjoying the seventh day rest, instead of obeying God with all of our hearts and minds and souls and strength, human beings rebelled against God and they chose to go their own way. And now that we're stained by sin and we live in this fallen world, we're not in Eden anymore. We are exiles. We're restless. We're hurried. We have a disordered relationship to our work. Kelsey talked about that last week. And we also have a disordered relationship to our rest. It's like we're stuck in limbo now. And Genesis and the rest of the Old Testament give us this hope of, wow, the seventh day, that would be amazing to just be at rest with God. 
But who can get us there? Our big question, remember, how can we find rest in a world of hurry? Well, this is where Jesus enters the picture. Go ahead and turn with me to the Gospel of Matthew in the New Testament. So we're in the first uh, book of the Old Testament, and now let's go to the first book of the New Testament. Matthew chapter 11, where we see the rescue of rest. Now, before I read these verses, let me set up the context. So right after God saved Israel from slavery, he commanded them to take one day off every week. He called it the Sabbath, right? It alludes to God ceasing from his work. And it was to be like a weekly reenactment of the seventh day, as though Israel could just taste a little bit of what that eternal rest in Eden was supposed to be like. And God said that actually keeping the Sabbath was part of their covenant relationship. It was part of their their law. In order to be faithful to God under the covenant of Moses, they had to Shabbat, to cease from their work. And then beyond that, every year Israel celebrated seven feasts. And then every seven years, the whole nation would forgive debts and they would uh, uh, rest from working the land. That's every seven years. And then every seven times seven years, all slaves would be liberated, all debt would be erased, all land would be restored from people who had lost it, and there is this year of jubilee. And so taking it all together, Israel's whole calendar was designed to remind them of the promise of future rest. How could they forget the promise of future rest. They do all these sevens in their calendar. But as we've seen throughout the the thread series, Israel was consistently, repeatedly unfaithful to God. They didn't keep the Sabbath. They didn't keep the year of Jubilee. They didn't obey God's other commands. We still can't find rest because the problem isn't with our schedules. The problem is something deeper in our hearts. There is an innate restlessness all human beings have And so when we come to Jesus' day, there were some prominent religious leaders who saw this problem, but they taught that the way to find rest was by following rules, by practicing a very strict adherence to the Sabbath. So the Sabbath becomes not a weekly reminder of eternal rest, but just another form of work, really. The Sabbath had lost its meaning. And so it's into this context that Jesus stands up in front of all the religious leaders And he says this, look at Matthew 11, verse 28. Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Jesus invites any and all, not just the religious or the righteous, but all people made in the image of God to come to him and learn how to rest. He's saying, do you want to break the cycle of hurry in your life? Do you want to experience peace with God? Do you want the promise of future rest to sink down deep into your souls? Then come and follow me, and I will give you rest. Now, if you have a Bible in front of you or you have it on your phone, just glance down for a moment at the very next two stories that take place after Jesus says these words. Both stories, you'll notice, have to do with the Sabbath, with this practice of Sabbath. Jesus is contending with the Pharisees. He calls himself the Lord of the Sabbath. Now, why do we have these verses about rest, these words Jesus says, and these stories about Sabbath right next to each other? I think it's because Jesus is saying, he's claiming to be the fulfillment of the Sabbath. He's saying, I am the seventh day rest. You want to find eternal paradise that was promised in Genesis? Come to me, and I will give you rest. And that's exactly what the author of Hebrews says in chapters 3 and 4. He says, Israel's weekly practice of, you know, Sabbath, of taking one day off from work, it it did give them rest and well-being, but in a temporary sense. It was all meant to point them toward the ultimate source of rest, which is life in Jesus. So if you hear nothing else this morning, hear this. You will find the deepest rest for your souls by coming to Jesus, by trusting Jesus your life in his, and then by following him. 
Or to put it as an answer to our big question, how can we find rest in a world of hurry? We can find rest by believing in and living out the gospel of Jesus. Remember what we said at the beginning, the gospel is not about what we do, but about what God has done, giving us grace. Jesus gives us rest, why? Because he lived the perfect life that we should have lived. He did everything right. He fulfilled the requirements of God's righteous law, and yet he took your place on a dirty cross, dying the death that you deserve for your rebellion. And on that cross, just like God finishing his work of creation, Jesus bore the full punishment for sin and he screamed out for all to hear, it is finished, the work is done. You want seventh day rest? Come to me. And then three days later, he rose from the dead to defeat death and he said, I am making all things new. A new creation is happening right now. And one day, Jesus is going to return and he's going to bring that paradise that our souls are longing for. The day when there is no more evening and morning, there's just life with God, peace with each other, final rest. Jesus is saying that no matter what people try to sell you, you really can't buy rest. A timeshare just won't do it. The cabin on the lake, it won't give you rest. He has already bought it for you, and he's offering it to you now as a gift of grace. If you are not a Christian this morning, all you need to do is to say, Jesus, I need you. You invite me to come and find rest in you while I'm here. I trust in you. I want to follow you. I want to find my rest in you. You can pray that this morning. And if you do, would you mind just coming up to me after the service? I'd love to give you a hug (laughs) as my brother and my sister. And here's the thing. If you are already a Christian, if you already follow Jesus and are prone like me to wander away into that cycle of hurry and busyness, then let Jesus' words bring you back to where you belong. Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Some of you uh, may be familiar with John Bunyan's Pilgrim's Progress, right? It's an allegory. It's a story uh, describing what it's like to become a Christian and then to live the Christian life. And it opens with a character named Christian, very inventive, John Bunyan. Uh, And Christian has this massive weight on his back, that he can't get off himself. He's sort of hunched over for the first part of the story. He's barely able to walk, and he's desperately trying to get relief from this burden. So let me read part of the story for you, the part where the burden finally gets taken off. Now I saw in my dream that the highway up which Christian was to go was fenced on either side with a wall, and that wall was called salvation. Up this way, therefore, did burdened Christian run but not without great difficulty because of the load on his back. He ran thus till he came at a place somewhat ascending, and upon that place stood a cross, and a little below at the bottom, a tomb. So I saw in my dream that just as Christian came up to the cross, his burden loosed from his shoulders and fell off his back and began to tumble, and so continued to do so till it came to the mouth of the tomb where it fell in, and I saw it no more. Then Christian was glad and lightsome, and he said with a merry heart, He hath given me rest by his sorrow and life by his death. And we've said a lot about the meaning of Sabbath and rest, kind of what it represents, but but let's bring it down to a practical level because our to-do lists are still waiting, right? (laughs) There's still things to do, and we need help with this cycle of hurry. So we've already said that we can find rest in God, but now what I want to do is kind of transition and show us how we can rest like God. See, there are different opinions among 
very smart Christians uh, about whether the church needs to follow a strict Sabbath like uh, Israel did. And I encourage you to do more study on the topic so you can figure out kind of where your conscience lies. Um, For me personally, because we are not under the covenant of Moses, but under the new covenant of Jesus, I consider Sabbath to be not in the realm of law, but in the realm of wisdom. So in other words, I don't see it as a command that Christians must take a day off of work every week, and if you don't do it, then it's a sin. I don't think it's in the realm of law. I think it's more in the realm of wisdom. All of us should seriously consider the wisdom of God's design and the way that he worked and rest. And we should consider having, like him, a weekly rhythm of rest. So It's interesting how in Jesus' day, like the main conflict that Jesus had around Sabbath was with uh, legalists, this culture of rules and legalism around the Sabbath. In our day, the much more common problem is not that kind of culture of strict Sabbatarianism and legalism. Usually it's kind of the other side of the pendulum where people have just kind of forgotten or ignored the Sabbath. And so let me give you three practical principles for you to take home as you consider the wisdom uh, of resting like God with this weekly habit of rest. So first, first principle, the Sabbath was made for you. This is what Jesus says to the legalists of his day, but it equally applies to the other side of the pendulum, those who ignore the Sabbath. I think it changes everything to see rest not as a rule, but as a gift, It's an opportunity that God has created for you to enjoy this world and then to look forward to the opportunity we have to experience future rest. So here's just a quick and dirty definition of Sabbath. I've got it up on the the screen. The Sabbath is a finite day to celebrate present salvation and eternal rest. It's just one, if it's a finite day, it's one day a week. And it's an opportunity to celebrate all that Jesus has done for you and then to long for what Jesus will do when he returns and gives us that future seventh day rest. You, you've heard the phrase working for the weekend, right? You know, the idea is you're just, you're just trying to work through the week all for that rest. That is, the gospel is the opposite of that. You are given rest right at the outset, rest in God, and then you are waiting for the seventh day rest. It's a gift. The Sabbath is not about regulation. It's about liberation. Just, isn't it amazing? I was struck by this this week. Isn't it amazing that we serve a God who stopped from his work of rest and then turned to us with a smile and said, now it's your turn. It's okay. I made this for you. You can rest. And maybe this is new for you this morning, the, 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 the idea that one of the ways that God cares for you is by suggesting that it is good and wise to take one day a week where you can nap, where you can grill burgers for your friends, where you can go and play at Park Point, where you can walk around the forest at Hartley, where you can be non-productive where you can do what Charles Spurgeon called holy inaction and consecrated leisure. So think about this. The Sabbath was made for you. Have you ever thought about that? Second principle. The Sabbath is a practice of humility. So oftentimes what that cycle of hurry does is it gives us the illusion that we are limitless. So, of course, if I were to ask any of you, you would say, yeah, I I know I need rest But then we continue to just grind ourselves into the ground with that cycle of busyness, that relentless pace of life. So in our modern context, taking one day to rest is a powerful countercultural declaration against pride. You are saying to everyone around you, I am not God. I have limits. That's a good thing. We need to cease from our work. Have you ever thought about the fact that human beings are so weak that we need to rest not only every week, but every day? John Piper uh, has this fantastic quote. He said, sleep is a daily reminder from God that we are not God. Once a day, God sends us to bed like patients with a sickness. The sickness is a chronic tendency to think we are in control and that our work is indispensable. To cure us of this disease, God turns us into helpless sacks of sand once a day. That's great. 
So in all that we do, we want to, be, we want to follow the example of Jesus, who was the most humble man who ever lived. And if you look at the life of Jesus, Jesus both worked very hard and rested very deeply. In fact, he kind of got in trouble for that sometimes. Sometimes he was working when others thought he should be resting. And other times he was sleeping when others thought he should be working. Jesus teach us, teaches us that a life of humility isn't just affirming, yeah, I know I need to rest. I know I'll get to rest eventually. It's actually following up with your actions, with your schedules, with your rhythms of life. Or to put it in another way, if someone, if a stranger were to look at your kind of monthly calendar or your daily planner, what would they conclude about your life? What conclusions would they draw? That leads me to my third principle. The Sabbath reveals the desires of our hearts. If you're listening to this and you think, I cannot practice a weekly day of rest, if your days are too full, and your life is too hectic, if you are not just busy, but you are overly busy, if you are constantly saying no to good and important things, sorry, can't make it. If you cannot conceive of taking a vacation and it's been that way for months or years, if you are always exhausted and you have no energy for the things that matter, then it's worth pondering what is keeping me from resting. Why am I hurrying? It's a hard question to ask. Is it because you have created an idol of productivity? I have to keep moving or else nothing will get done. Is it because you have made an idol of money or a certain standard of living? If I don't keep up, we won't have as comfortable a life as we want. Is it because you fear silence and inactivity, not knowing what would actually happen if you slowed down and actually thought about your own life? And here's one that may challenge the families in the room. When is it loving to tell your kids no to activities because it's worth protecting a rhythm of rest? Not saying sports are bad, not saying activities are bad, but when does it get to the point where you're elevating the desires of your kids or your desires for your kids to do things above the way that God has made you in needing rhythms of work and rhythms of rest? Now, these questions are not meant to shame or judge you. They're meant to get you to think about your own life and your own heart. What we're trying to do, all of us, myself included, we're trying to get at how this heart works because it's a mystery to even myself at times. And when we figure out our own heart, we're trying to say, okay, Lord, how do I give you all of it? Kyle has a phrase that he often uses when he's, he's talking about the Sabbath. Uh, he says, what are some personal legalisms that you need in your life? They're rules, but they're just rules for you. You will not put them on anybody else. Some personal legalisms that you need in your life. What are the rules that you need for yourself and your family to live more faithfully to Jesus? So, for example, for me, um, when I can, I try and turn my phone off on Saturdays because my personal legalism is that I know that I usually rest better without it. But it's a personal legalism, and I, I hesitate even mentioning it because I'm not saying you do that. What I am saying is that this is between you and God. This is the realm of wisdom. This is where you are asking God to sh show me how I should rest, God. Show me the areas of my life where I'm caught in that hamster wheel of hurry. Show me how to get out of that. So here's just the first step, and this is where I'll close. The first step this week, talk to God about rest, about your rest, about your family's rest. Speak from the heart, and then listen to the Holy Spirit. In fact, let's, let's do that together now, and I'll have the worship team come up. Let's pray. Father God, why is it so hard for us to rest? It's because we misunderstand how you have made us. You love it when we are resting in you, and then when we are using our gifts and talents to work for your kingdom. So Father, I ask that as each of us has that conversation with you this week, as each of us takes some time to talk with you about our weekly schedule, 
about the things we've said yes to and the things we've said no to. Father, I pray first of all that you would give us rest in the gospel, every person here, that you would show us how we don't work for our salvation, but how we trust fully in the work of Jesus Christ for us, and then show us how to live like Jesus. We pray this in Jesus' good and holy name. Amen. We're going to turn our attention now to the communion table, uh, the Lord's Supper. This is where Jesus invites you to find your soul rest in him. By remembering his body broken for you on the cross, his blood shed for you. If you are a Christian, then this meal, see this as an opportunity to begin that conversation with God that we talked about. You could pray while you're, you're taking the, the bread and the juice, Jesus, help me to find my rest in you. This is my starting point, remembering the cross and the empty tomb. Uh, if you are not a Christian, this is just a practice for our, our church family. Um, as, as we say most weeks, I, I wouldn't want you to say uh, something that is true about yourself that is not true. And so there's no shame for you to just sit and think and, and ponder these things. I'm really glad that you're here asking these questions. Um, but if you did become a Christian this morning, if for the very first time you thought, that life that Jesus offers, that eternal rest, that sounds pretty good, and I trust that Jesus can, can do that for me, then I welcome you to this table. And like I said, I would love to meet you after the service and give you a hug and take you out for lunch and, and hear about your story. But I'm going to pray one more time, and then when you're ready, you can come up the center aisles and, and head towards the back. There's also contactless communion in the back if, if you would prefer that. Let me pray for us. Jesus, thank you for communion. Thank you for these tangible reminders of all that you have done for us. Jesus, help us not to forget. When we are prone to wander, pull us back like the good shepherd you are. I thank you for my church family. I pray that you would be with us this week. In Jesus' name, amen. Turn to your seats. Would you please stand and join us in worship? to 
gracious Savior of my ruined life. My guilt and cross lay on your shoulders. In my place you suffered, bled, and died. You
who you are. Jesus, we declare that you are healer, defender, strong and mighty. And Lord, it is often when we declare who you are, when we are reminded of who you are, that we remember who we are not, that we are not our Savior. There's nothing that we are striving to accomplish, Lord, outside of who you are. Jesus, would we rest in that today? Would we have peace because of all you've accomplished um, in this place? It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You can have a seat for just a moment as we go over some announcements today. My name is Heidi. I'm one of our worship leaders here at Rock Hill. Um, and I just have two announcements for you today. The Lord has blessed us with gorgeous weather. Um, and today is the Lincoln Park cleanup. So after the first service, if you're able to head on over there right down to Lincoln Park, we're going to do some um, cleanup in the park for just blessing the neighbors that are around us. Around noon, there will be a picnic. And then after the second service. We're going to send another group there as well. So um, if you're in your nice church clothes today, not ready to clean, you can head home first and come back. Um, there'll be people there throughout the day. Uh, the other opportunity we have is pizza with the pastor today after the second service in the church office just across the street. This is a time where you get fed pizza. Who wouldn't love that? Um, and if you're wanting to learn more about Rock Hill, it gives you a chance to meet with one of our pastors, get some of your questions answered, um, and really learn about what, what makes us tick around here, what, what we stand for, and, and what drives what we do. So both of those opportunities are available today. If you have any questions, certainly find one of the leadership team here as well. Um, and now I'm going to have you stand back up, and we're going to send you on your way, um, remembering that at Rock Hill, you are not dismissed, but you are sent to declare the gospel, to display the gospel, and to delight in the gospel of Jesus Christ. Have a great day.